The Cooler Master H500P case features two huge and distinctive 200mm RGB fans up front, a tinted tempered glass side panel window, and a vertical GPU mount. With room for 360 rads on the top and front, a tasteful PSU shroud, and helpful cable management covers in the back, the H500P will make your next build both easy and sexy, just like me. Click the link in the description for more. Excellent! Hey guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. Today's video is my follow-up to my entry-level Threadripper build. This system all put together with current pricing costs about $1,850, so I know that's expensive for entry-level, but we're talking about Threadripper here. We're talking about a high-end desktop computer, and uh, the CPU at the heart of this system is the AMD Threadripper 1900X, which is an eight-core, 16-thread processor, and it is the cheapest CPU that you can purchase to get yourself into this platform. Now, my advice to people uh, who are looking to build something like this is consider that CPU as an entry level point and then possibly upgrading to the 12 core 1920X or the 16 core 1950X. And who knows, maybe AMD will release even higher core count CPUs on this platform in the future. We're not really sure. I know nothing about that, by the way, I'm just speculating. But uh, first off, a quick rundown of the parts that's installed and then I'm gonna go through the setup process and we're gonna do some testing on the system to give you guys a better idea of the performance. Now, first off, I have swapped two parts out of this from the build that uh, was published last week, and uh, that's linked in the description if you guys wanna check it out. First thing is gonna be our graphics card. I originally installed an NVIDIA Founders Edition GTX 1070 Ti, and that has been swapped for the Zotac Mini version of the 1070 Ti. It's basically the same design as their GTX 1070 Mini from Zotac, a two-fan design, and a fairly short overall design. The PCB is only about seven inches long and the entire card is only about eight and a half inches long. So that actually gives us a little bit more breathing room towards the front of this system uh, where the CPU cooler is. Uh, and I swapped that out last night and actually the Zotac logo lights up in white, which max matches a little bit better with the white logo lighting up on our CPU cooler. CPU cooler is the Enermax Liquimax Threadripper edition, the 240 millimeter version of that, uh, substantial 240 millimeter alum aluminum all-in-one liquid cooler in the front, uh, some very nice clean looking uh, tubing on there as well. And uh, that is already keeping the CPU very cool, uh, although we're gonna test that a little bit further in just a moment here. Our motherboard is the ASRock X399 Tai Chi, which uh, at 330-ish dollars is, again, still entry level when it comes to Threadripper. The motherboards tend to be fairly expensive, although it is a very, very nice motherboard from the testing I've done so far. Uh, it's got all the stuff you'd want it, like a debug LED, surface mount and power and reset buttons, uh, eight DDR4 DIMM slots for lots of memory, uh, and even a little bit of RGB LED on there, although it is subtle, it's just uh, lighting up blue right now. Uh, and I haven't installed the software yet to, to uh, play with that. The memory is a G-Skill kit, and what I actually installed in here in the build originally was a 32 gig kit. This is actually back to a 16 gig kit, G-Skill, 16 gigs, 4x4, DDR4. It is DDR4 3200 speed, and actually that is uh, one of the things that I have not set up. I've set up most of the stuff on the system yet, but the memory is still at 2133, so I need to go and set that up. Beyond that, the rest of the hardware is registering in the operating system. So of course we got our 2900X here, X299 Tai Chi motherboard. There is our memory, the graphics card showing up here as well. And um, if you're looking at the actual speeds here for the uh, 1070 Ti, they are locked as far as the speeds from the manufacturer. You can overclock this if you want to yourself. I'm gonna be running it at the stock speeds today just to show you guys what you get coming out of the box with this, uh, but it's got a base clock of 1607 and a boost of 1683. We'll see how much higher it gets beyond that. Uh, for storage, we're keeping things pretty simple from the get-go. Again, as an entry-level system, my recommendation is to find yourself a 250 gigabytes or thereabouts SSD. For this particular build, I'm using a Kingston HyperX Fury SSD, uh, and that is gonna get the job done. It's a SATA SSD, and that gives us tons more expandability options for both adding drives, as well as utilizing the NVMe M.2 slots that are available on this motherboard, since one of the main reasons why you might consider Threadripper is taking advantage of all those PCI Express Gen 3 lanes. Again, since this is entry level, we're not really doing that. I don't have a bunch of NVMe drives that are gonna be plugged in, but expandability future upgrade options are all there, of course. Uh, to test today, I have also connected up an SSD just externally so I can load games off of it, and uh, that's just connected via USB 3.0. 
Our power supply is a Corsair RM850i. Um, if you look at the description and the parts list for this system, I've recommended a 750 watt power supply. This is just one that I have and is functional and able to be used and put in this system because this system is actually going to be a set up for a charity auction giveaway uh, that Kyle and I are gonna be running towards the beginning of December. Still more details forthcoming on that, but we've decided we're probably gonna be doing the everyone does a small donation amount and then we pick a winner from all the people who have done donations. So this system could be yours in the future, who knows? And finally, of course, the case, the Fractal Meshify C chosen, uh, not just because it looks pretty sexy, but also because it's got a nice big tempered glass side panel window so you can look inside at your finished build and Lots of airflow, since this is a system that could potentially have lots of hardware integrated into it on top of what's already there. You wanna have plenty of airflow to keep things cool. Now, speaking of airflow, that was actually one of the first things that I needed to do with this system. Well, technically the first thing was updating the BIOS. I did that when the, on the X399 Tai Chi motherboard first off, because the BIOS it shipped with was a very early revision. In fact, the re revision I had wasn't even available for download on their website. But I've updated now to version 1.7. That is the version that has support for NVMe RAID on this platform as well, which is a really nice other nice feature of the Threadripper platform. You can take multiple devices that are NVMe connected, RAID them up, and even make them bootable. I haven't gotten into testing that either yet. Hopefully I will soon. But the trade-off there is that I have a really nice CPU cooler here from Enermax, and that has already been keeping the CPU temperature super chilly. In Hardware Info 64, you can see the actual free temperature, and then you can see the offset temperature as well. So uh, I haven't run a, a load test on this, but we're gonna do that in just a second. But we can already see we're idling down in the 28 to 29 degrees Celsius range. Transition. All right, I don't know if you guys can tell, but uh, I've changed some things here. Basically, I was getting the memory set up and I had everything configured, and all I had to do was go into the UEFI and actually set the XMP settings for my memory, which I had uh, switched over to this Rips Jaws 5 kit from G-Skill. All the memory I'm using in the testing today is from G-Skill, but not all memory is made the same. And since Ryzen likes faster memory, I recommend typically trying to hit that 2933 memory divider if you can't get up to 3200, uh, but that will get you better performance, uh, single threaded performance, better gaming performance out of Ryzen processors, both on the mainstream side as well as talking about Threadripper here. So. When I discovered that this kit was amongst the memory kits that I had, I was excited because it's uh, the speed is 3200, DDR4 3200, Castle NC16, uh, pretty tight timings, not not the tightest, but uh, pretty good. However, could just could not get it to, to post at all, trying to run at the XMP settings, 3200. Uh, little quirk to the UEFI here from ASRock, you actually have to go in and tell it to use XMP settings, and then you can go and, and change the actual memory speed if you want it. So I tried the 3200, I, tw I tried that weird 3066 or whatever it is, tried 2933, tried loosening the timings up, nothing was working, couldn't get it to post. So decided to switch over to this kit, Trident Z kit, also from G-Skill, with the super tight 3200 speed cast latency 14 timings that the kit I have in there right now is using. This one won't work either. Um, there's quirks, there's different types of memory, there's different types of modules that they actually stick on the memory. There's dual rank and single rank, depending on whether you have memory on just one side or memory on both sides. All these things can affect compatibility with Ryzen platforms. So all this is to say, I have been spoiled so far because most of the memory I've tried with Ryzen has been pretty successful for me. But if you run into this issue, the solution is going to be the motherboard's manufacturer's website. Go over to the support page for your particular uh, motherboard, check the memory QVL list. These are basically memory kits that ASRock has tested themselves and verified to work at the faster speeds. You'll see single channel, dual channel, and quad, quad channel, whether or not it's verified. Uh, it looks like they put different notes for these. And here you have ADATA, Vexir, Corsair, Crucial, G-Skill. So I, for example, just did a quick search for the specific memory kits that uh, I attempted to use and it's not on this list at all. So um, that's probably an indication that it hasn't been tested and probably wouldn't expect it to, to work. So anyway, just double check this list if you wanna make sure that the memory kit that you get works with the motherboard that, and then the configuration that you're using and you'll have a much better time just going in there and plugs it, plugging in XMP values and not having to go through troubleshooting and everything. Long story short, I have now installed the G-Skill Trident Z RGB kits that I have used with lots of different Ryzen uh, tests and different uh, Threadripper tests and I know it works and lo and behold, I, I installed it, set the XMP 3200 Cast Latency 14 and it works. 
Uh, it needed to boot twice, and now it works. Um, so yeah. But let's move on from there and do some uh, audio testing. Uh, first off, I did notice that everything was pretty loud when I first set this system up, so I had to go into the UEFI and go into the fan test, it's fan, whatever, the, the fan tuning function in the ASRock UEFI, and that allowed me to just uh, default set all of the fans connected to silent mode, and that has quieted things down greatly, uh, although it does still, of course, ramp up when the CPU temperature increases. But here's a quick sound test at idle. That's not the quietest, but it's not too bad at all. Now let's try a burn test. I'm gonna run Unigen Heaven 4.0, as well as the Ida 64 burn test at the same time, and let it run about 15 minutes, and then let's see what it sounds like. So as you can probably tell from that sound test, the Meshify allows lots of air to flow through. It also lets out a pretty decent amount of noise. And of course, we're doing a full system burn test right now. I'm running Indigent Heaven uh, 4.0 as well as the Ida 64 system stability test. So this is about the max that you could reasonably expect as far as uh, a load on the CPU and the GPU at the exact same time. All that said, it's been going for a little over 15 minutes now, and fortunately, the CPU clock speeds have been, been pretty consistent. We're hitting at about 3.8 to 3.9 gigahertz across all of the cores, all eight of them, so that's pretty nice. In fact, I feel like you couldn't do much better manually overclocking this CPU compared to what it is right now, but of course, Threadripper CPUs do get binned dies. They get the best rise in dies that goes into Threadripper, so we should expect pretty good clock speeds and performance from them. Now again, that offset is showing us a CPU temperature of 94 degrees with a max of 101.6, but again, that's 27 degrees hotter than it actually is. The actual max temperature for the CPU was 74.6 during this test, and uh, we're actually hitting more around the high 60s is, is what it's actually settling in at. Now, Ida64 is showing the temperature slowly climbing, and that is again because we're using an all-in-one liquid CPU cooler, and the liquid will slowly get warmer and warmer over time. It can take a half an hour to an hour to actually hit the max uh, temperature, but chances are we're not uh, gonna get more than a couple of degrees warmer than we currently are right now. And here we can see that our Zotac 1070 Ti Mini doing a fine job, uh, especially given that there's a lot of heat going on in the system right now from the CPU and the GPU at the same time. Again, I have not done any overclocking of this card and it's hitting about uh, 1911 megahertz max frequency, although it's typically sitting more at the 1825 to 1850 megahertz range right in there. So not bad at all, uh, considering that we haven't overclocked and it's running at the stock frequencies. And I would imagine you could probably put, push this up another 100 megahertz or so with a bit of manual overclocking. Temperatures as well are perfectly reasonable. Uh, 75 degrees is what it's sitting at right now. It only topped out at 76. So again, for a smaller size card with a smaller size cooler and two fans on there, I think this is actually a great uh, combination for this particular system. So next up, let's do some actual testing. I've run a few CPU benchmarks and a few gaming benchmarks just to give you guys a better idea of how this system will perform. I just wanna point out that I have not tested the CPU at all ever before and I've not tested this GPU, the 1070 Ti, at all ever before. So I don't have a whole lot of comparison numbers because I don't think that would be fair uh, to do a direct comparison. Although I do have some stuff for the CPU to show what it's up against. But let's start out with Cinebench, the multi-threaded test here. And what I would expect to see from the eight core Threadripper is basically an 1800X level performance, but a little bit faster because it is gonna be running at a slightly higher frequency, mostly due to the fact that it's better been chipped and XFR in my experience with Threadripper has led to higher uh, peak clock speed. And in fact, we're running at about 3.8 or 3.9 when under full load across all the cores, and it's running at about 4.1 to 4. Point, I think at 4.166 was the max single core frequency that I saw, which is pretty nice. And in fact, probably a faster single core speed than you can achieve if you're doing an all core overclock and trying to get to 4.0 or 4.1. 
which is doable, but anyway, I didn't want I didn't want this to be mainly about overclocking. Let's look at the numbers. Cinebench is up first, of course, and I do have some comparison numbers for this. 1743 was our multi-threaded score. That is uh, just a little bit, uh, just a little over 100 points faster than our R7-1800X, which hit 1644. Single threaded performance hit 167. And here, if you're looking at some of the Intel comparisons, of course, they do have a better single core performance. However, 167 is, again, a few points higher than our 1800X, which scored 160. For CPU mark, our overall score was 17,913, a very respectable score. And in fact, faster than most of the mainstream stuff that I, or pretty much all the mainstream stuff I've tested, which makes sense, faster than 1800X. And you really have to go up to something like a 1950X or a 1920X on the AMD side, or something like a 7960X or 7980XE on the Intel X enthusiast platform in order to get higher than that. Single thread performance still holding strong at just over 2000, 2096. And that again, just edges out the 1800X's score of 2081. Next, I threw some Blender render tests at it, starting with Splash Fish Fishy Cat. Remember these are time in seconds, so a lower score is better here. 32.9 seconds was the score for the 1900X. And again, that's just a little bit faster than the 1800X's 33.6 seconds. Next is the BMW 27 render. Takes a little bit more time, so 278 seconds was the score for our 1900X. Yet again, beating out the 1800X, and I will point out here, also beating out the i7-8700K. Next, let's move into some gaming tests, starting off with 3 d Mark Fire Strike Ultra. Uh, again, not doing many comparisons here, but I wanna focus on the physics tests on the CPU side. 20,449 was the 1900X's score, with a graphic score of 4710 and an overall score of 4824. My comparison numbers here, bear in mind please, we're using 1080 Ti's, so uh, the GPU score is definitely not comparable, but the physics score maybe is. And at 20,000, it did beat out all of these tests I've run currently on the mainstream platform, whether you're looking at uh, Ryzen or at Intel's Coffee Lake or Kaby Lake. Moving along to Rise of the Tomb Raider DirectX 12 test, and I'm doing the Geothermal Valley test specifically for this one. 110.2 frames per second was the average frame rate at 1920 by 1080 with a minimum of 77.9. And moving up to 1440, we had an average of 70.1 with a minimum of 58.1. And our final test, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. At 1920 by 1080, we had an average frame rate of 81 FPS. 0.1% low was 46 FPS. And at uh, 2560 by 1440, average frame rate was just over 60. So that's good. That's a good number to be able to hit with the 1070 Ti. 61 FPS on average and a 0.1% low of 40.5. So there you go guys, some tests on my entry level Threadripper build coming in at the low, low price of about $1,850. Uh, I'm pretty impressed with this system overall, although of course it does come with a set of caveats like most systems do to some degree. Main issue for me, at least testing this, was of course the memory configuration. Getting fast memory to run with a Ryzen or Threadripper processor is definitely the way to go. However, it can be quirky and this was probably my first experience encountering some actual difficulties getting um, some sticks of memory just to plug in and play nice at the rated speeds that the memory was set to. So a definite uh, encouragement for me to you guys to double check those uh, memory QVL lists, make sure that whatever kit you've gotten has been tested at the rated speed, or dive into some of the more advanced overclocking features. Uh, there are several videos on that. I still theoretically have one coming on that as well, because there are some extra things that you can do with memory to try to eke out a little bit more performance or get it, get it running at the proper speed. For my solution, uh, it's not a very practical one for the actual intent of this build because the kit I put in there costs about twice as much, if not more than twice as much as most of the 16 gig 4x4 kits that you can buy that are even that same rated speed. But what I'm gonna do is get a kit that I can swap into here to go along with the giveaway uh, that is rated at at least 3000, if not 3200. So you will, if you happen to end up with the system, you'll be able to see the same speeds that I did in my testing today. And for now, uh, you know, we've got the G skill RGB stuff in there. So, you know, it's RGB. I guess I couldn't escape RGB for this build, no matter how much I tried. Other than that though, uh, the case of course, Nice, good airflow. Temperatures were very reasonable uh, throughout, and I like the combination of the high airflow case as well as that uh, Enermax, uh, Liquimax Threadripper uh, specific cooler. I uh, thought the GPU did a great job as well. Um, very reasonable speeds, very reasonable temperatures, uh, very reasonable noise as well, I would say, also generated from that. 
So if you guys are interested uh, in this build and maybe putting it together for yourself, a list of all the parts is down in the description below. So feel free to check that out. If you have any feedback for me on my testing of this system or the build in general, of course, leave those comments in the comment section as well. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I'll be back with more very soon. So don't forget to subscribe to Paul's Hardware. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.